I welcome everybody again to our evening lecture series on clinical nutrition and obesity. Tonight, we are fortunate to have Dr. Rena Wing from the University of Pittsburgh uh, with us to give a presentation entitled Behavioral Approaches to the Treatment of Obesity and Type 2 Diabetes. Dr. Wing has been a long time, I won't say how long, but uh, investigator uh, dealing primarily with the behavioral and psychological uh, approaches to the treatment of uh, various diseases, but especially in the area of obesity and uh, diabetes. Uh, she is a member of our National Task Force on Prevention and Treatment of Obesity and is past president of the Society of Behavioral Medicine. Uh, this past year, uh, she has been the principal investigator on our recently awarded uh, Obesity Nutrition Research Center at the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, as a result of that, is actually uh, pulling together a lot of other individuals that are in the Pittsburgh community to help work on the problem of obesity and obesity prevention. And we'd like to go ahead and welcome her and have her uh, give her presentation. It's a great pleasure to be here today and speak with you on the topic of behavioral approaches to obesity and diabetes. My goal today is to try to show you some of the changes that we've made in this area recently. I'm going to try to document some of the changes that have occurred between the 1980s and the 1990s as we move into this decade. What are we doing now in the way of behavioral treatments of obesity? Before I begin my talk, though, I think it's important to make sure that you have some understanding of what is a behavioral treatment for obesity and what were the kinds of treatments that were being done in the 1980s. The basic premise of a behavioral approach to obesity are twofold. First, we assume that by changing behaviors, in this case, eating and exercise behaviors, we will be able to change somebody's body weight. And secondly, we assume that these behaviors, these eating and exercise behaviors, are controlled by the environment the person lives in by the antecedents or cues in the environment that set the stage for eating, such as the sight and smell of a food, and by the reinforcers that come after eating and lead to its recurrence, such as the good taste of an apple pie. Our hypothesis is that if we can change these antecedents and consequences, we can change the behavior. Now, to accomplish this, to try to change these behaviors and change the antecedents and consequences, what we do is we develop behavioral treatment programs. These usually involve weekly group meetings for 10 to 20 weeks, and then periodic follow-up, maybe two or three times per year. One of the major techniques we use in a behavioral treatment program is a technique called self-monitoring, which is just a fancy word for saying keeping a diary of your eating and exercise behaviors. Now we want to focus on someone's behavior. As I said, they're eating and exercise. So we want a way to make patients in our program aware of their current eating and exercise habits and of changes they might make, more positive changes. And we do this by asking people to write down everything they eat and the calories in those foods. And pretty quickly, patients start to see patterns in their eating and exercise behavior, and we, as part of the therapy, can help them change those patterns. Now, as soon as you start writing down your eating and exercise behavior, people want to have a goal. What should they be eating? What should they be doing for exercise? So we set goals as part of the behavior program. And usually, the goal we set for caloric intake in our program is for patients to eat about 1,200 to 1,500 calories a day. And usually, the goal we set for exercise is a goal of walking about two miles a day on each of five days in the week. 
And later, if you want, I can talk with you more about why we set those specific goals. But then, as part of the behavioral treatment program, what we do is we help patients learn to arrange the antecedents in the environment and the consequences to help them establish new, better, more appropriate eating and exercise behaviors. So for example, a very simple behavioral technique would be to instruct patients to take the high calorie foods out of their home so that the high calorie foods are not sitting there as a cue to eat them and rather to go to the grocery store and buy carrots and celery, wash them, prepare them, keep them visible in the refrigerator so that the low calorie foods cue them to eat the low calorie foods. And we also work to change the consequences or the reinforcers with techniques such as self-reinforcement strategies where patients are taught that if they follow their diet, are able to eat within their calorie goal for three or four days, then they might reinforce themselves by treating themselves to a new book that they wanted or a new blouse or some type of tangible reward. Now, what I think one thing that I want you to realize is that behavior modification, when it works, can really work. And we can sometimes be extremely successful. And what I thought I would do is show you a case of an individual patient that we treated who was a 55-year-old man with type 2 diabetes. And when he first came to us, <clears throat> we asked him to write down all the foods that he had been eating and to figure out the calories in it. This is what I mean by self-monitoring. So we asked him to write down what he had eaten the day before. And this is what he ate. Started out his breakfast with orange juice and then coffee and then an English muffin with some butter. Then he had some jam, sausage links, eggs, hash browns. For lunch, he had hot sausage, meatball, pineapple. He knew enough to throw in a diet drink. He then had hot sausage, meatballs, lasagna, wine, and remembered to have that diet drink again for dinner. For a total over the course of the day of 2,822 calories, and what's most striking is that 57% of those calories were from fat. Now, we treated this gentleman in a 20-week behavioral program, taught him uh, to monitor his intake, taught him healthier eating habits, and particularly helped him try to change his amount of fat he was eating. These are his results at the end of the 20-week program. Again, we asked him to record his intake for a day. Now he was starting off his day with pineapple and coffee. We would have liked him to eat a little more for breakfast, but that's what he chose to eat. Then for lunch, he had pasta, marinated vegetables, pineapple again. For dinner, he had pasta. He cooked his pasta. It looks like he was sort of making a cream sauce. sauce. He cooked it, cooked it with two tablespoons of margarine, milk, flour, and cheese. I think the poor guy was so hungry at this point that he was eating the flour. But we figured as long as it was high fiber, it would be all right for him. And then he had shrimp, scallops, and crab for dinner for a total of 1,424 calories, so about half as much as what he used to eat. And now, only 28% of those calories were coming from fat. Now, I don't show you this as a model diet by any means. I show you this just to show you the magnitude of changes that some individuals make in the types of foods they're eating and the quantity of foods they're eating. Now, if you make such dramatic changes like that in your behavior, you would expect it would translate into weight loss. And sure enough, it did for this gentleman. Here was his weight loss over the 20-week program. And you can see he reduced from 250 pounds at the beginning of the program to closer to 200 pounds by the end of the 22 weeks of the program. And let me just point out to you that his weight loss is very nice and steady over that program. Now, the next slide shows his fasting blood sugar. He was a type 2 diabetic. And his fasting blood sugar, when he started the program, was very, very high. His fasting blood sugar was 350. Normal fasting blood sugars would be about 140 or less. And you can see that within about two weeks in the program, three weeks maybe, this gentleman close to normalized his blood sugar. So even though his weight loss was coming down very steadily like this, his blood sugar had a dramatic initial decrease. This is typical of what we see in type 2 diabetics and has led us in some of our research to be very interested in the effects of caloric restriction independent of weight loss on blood sugar control in type 2 diabetics. And you can see over the course of the rest of the program, his blood sugars came down even further. But the vast majority of improvement occurred immediately. Now, the program ended after 20 weeks. And we asked him to come back at six months and a year to see how he was doing. 
And here you can see that this gentleman did a very nice job of maintaining his weight loss. He was 260 initially, then 199. He got it down a little further to 187 at six months and kept it like that at one year follow-up. Now I want to show you his percent of ideal body weight. He'd gone from 65% over ideal body weight to about 24% over ideal body weight. We usually define obesity as by anything over 20% above ideal body weight. So even at this end of this program, this gentleman would still be considered overweight or obese. But this, this amount of weight loss markedly improved and in fact normalized his blood sugar control. Shown here is a measure of long-term blood sugar control called hemoglobin A1. And in our laboratory, non-diabetic levels of hemoglobin A1 run, run from about 5.1 to 7.1. So anything under 7.1 would be like a non-diabetic. And you can see that from here, oopsie, from here on, this individual had normal blood sugar control. So one point I'd like to, to make from this case study is that behavior modification approaches can be very, very successful. And when they work in a type 2 diabetic, they can produce not only weight loss, but marked improvements in glycemic control. And the other point I'd like to make is that they, these individuals do not have to reduce to ideal body weight. Even modest weight losses can have a dramatic impact. Now, unfortunately, not all my patients or all of any pa any therapist's patients do as well in a behavioral treatment program as this gentleman did. And in fact, in an average weight loss program, in our average re when I average my results across all my patients, what we usually find is about a 20-pound weight loss at the end of 20 weeks. And we find that patients maintain a weight loss of about 11 pounds at the one-year follow-up. So clearly more modest than what this gentleman did. But what I want to point out to you is that even Oh, uh, that's that stuck slide again. <laughs> well, the slide will come on in a second. But what I want to point out is that even these modest weight losses of 10, 20, 30 pounds can have marked effects on. It's the one right after that. Can have marked effects on glycemic control and on lipids in type 2 diabetic patients. What's going to be shown on this slide in a minute is that individuals who lose just 15 to 30 pounds have significant long-term improvements in their fasting blood sugar, their insulin, their HDL cholesterol, the good cholesterol, and several other parameters. So it, well, here, here we go. Is people who lose just 15 to 30 pounds and maintain that at a year have significant long-term improvements in fasting blood sugar, insulin, triglycerides, and HDL, which is the good cholesterol, and you would want it to go up. And these individuals, just losing that amount of weight makes it go up significantly. All those changes are even better if patients lose more weight, if they lose 30 plus pounds. But even losing 15 to 30 is very important clinically and statistically for these individuals. So I think that's an important message for those of you who treat obese type 2 diabetic patients. These individuals do not have to get to ideal body weight, just modest weight losses, which would be much more reachable for them, will produce long-term improvements in these parameters. Now, these are really the concept of the behavioral program as we were doing it at the, in the 80s and at the end of the 80s. And these were really the types of results we were getting and, and points we were establishing. Now, as we've moved into the 90s, we've made a few changes in our concepts about behavior modification approaches that I'd like to share with you because I think you're going to see new programs using these new concepts. First of all, in our old programs, such as shown here, our patients were treated for 20 weeks, and then we assumed they learned everything, and they could do it on their own, and we stopped seeing them. And what we found was that patients regained their weight, except for these unusual cases like the one I showed you. Now what we have done is we have moved to a chronic disease model of obesity. We have realized that obese people have a chronic disease, just like hypertensives do, and that they are going to need to be in long-term, ongoing treatment, just the way you would treat hypertensives for a long term. You don't put a hypertensive on medication for 20 weeks, take them off, and expect their blood pressure to stay down a year later. But that's the model we've used thus far in obesity treatment. We treated patients for 20 weeks, 
hoped they would learn everything and could do it on their own forever. We find that they cannot do that, and we now realize that these patients need to remain in treatment, perhaps for the rest of their lives. There have been several studies that have used this long-term model of treatment and shown that it's much more successful from the, than the old model. This is one such study, a study by Michael Perry. What he did was recruited a group of overweight patients and randomly assigned them to one of five groups. This group up here, called BT, received a standard behavioral program, such as I was describing from the 80s. They were seen weekly for 20 weeks, and then they weren't seen any longer. You can see they lost weight nicely, and then when they stopped seeing these individuals, they regained their weight. And as I said before, they lose about 20 pounds, and then they regain, and they've maintained about 10 pounds. Typical behavioral program. Now, these four groups were all you treated using this chronic disease model in which they continued to come for treatment every other week for the full 18 months of the study. And you can see that all four of those other groups did much better throughout this period than this group did. Now, Dr. Perry studied exactly what kind of contact they should have. The C group just received contact. They just came every other week to the groups. The C plus A group came and actually did aerobic exercise. The C plus S group came and actually participated in some social support programs, like buddy systems. And the C plus A plus S had contact and aerobic exercise and social support. And you can see when you put them all together, it was a little better than the others. But actually, these treatment groups did not differ significantly from each other. So it appears that the most important thing was just seeing these patients for long periods of time. Now another thing that has changed in our approach to weight loss is that we're going beyond just telling people how to change the antecedents and consequences in their environment and actually trying to help them change their home environment. We've argued that we could probably get better results if we didn't just tell people what to eat, but if we actually gave them the food that they should eat. So we've actually studied food provision. And similarly, we argued that we would probably get better results if we didn't just tell people to pat themselves on the shoulder when they did a good job eating and exercising appropriately, but rather if we could actually financially reward them for doing a good job, so pay them to lose weight. We studied these two approaches and asked the question whether providing subjects with the food there to eat would improve outcome, and whether paying subjects to lose weight would improve outcome. And to study this, what we did was we recruited 200 individuals, 202, 100 males, 100 females, who were 37 years of age, weighed 89.8 kilograms, or about 200 pounds, and they had a body mass index of 31. So they're mildly overweight, relatively young individuals. These individuals were put in five different treatment approaches. One was a control group that got no treatment. They were just told, we'll see you again at six months, and if you, we'll follow your weight at that time. The standard intervention group was given a standard behavioral program where they were taught to self-monitor their intake and their exercise. They were encouraged to eat a low-calorie, low-fat diet to increase the amount of exercise, particularly walking, that they were doing. And they came in to see us every single week for the first 20 weeks. And then they had monthly meetings for the next 18 months and weekly weigh-ins throughout. Next group got the exact same behavioral treatment. Plus, in addition, every time they came into a weekly meeting, we gave them a box of food. And in that box of food was their bre five breakfasts for the week and five dinners for the week all prepackaged and arranged for them. So it there would be a little note in there saying, Monday morning you are to have one box of Cheerios, and it would be provided in the box, one container of skim milk, and it would be there, a banana and a, a container of orange juice. Everything would be in the box, and we would tell them exactly how many calories and how much fat they were eating. Same thing for dinner. And we often use Lean Cuisines for dinner, Weight Watchers Frozen Foods for dinner. Or we would prepackage something like a chicken breast plus some frozen peas plus some rice and set it up all in the correct portions for them at different calorie goals, depending on their initial body weight. Now, they, they got that food every single week for 18 months. 
Now this group got the same standard behavioral program. They didn't get any food, but they got paid to lose weight. Every week if they came in and had lost weight, they could earn up to $25 a week, depending on how much weight they'd lost or maintained. So over the course of a year, you could earn quite a bit of money, $25 a week, by getting your weight down and keeping it down. And this group got the standard behavioral program plus the box of food plus the money. And all these treatments were continued for 18 months. Now these were the results of that study. The group that got no treatment, the control, just stayed about the same in their weight. They didn't gain much, they didn't lose much. The standard behavioral program lost some weight and then regained some. And the standard behavioral plus money is sitting right there on top. Those two lines are right together. So giving the money didn't help at all. These are the two groups that were given the food. One's given just the food, and one's given the food plus money. And once again, you see no evidence that adding the money helped. But what you see dramatically is that the two groups given the food have much better weight losses than the groups that were not given the food at every single time period we studied. Now, unfortunately, the food provision didn't make perfect weight maintenance. Would have been nice if they came down on weight loss and kept it down. They didn't. But at every time period we studied, they had significantly better weight losses than the groups that were not given the food. Now, we investigated possible mechanisms whereby this food provision might be helping with weight loss. And we found that the individuals who were getting the food had better attendance. They would come to the treatment meetings because they wanted to get this food. They did more of this self-monitoring. They kept their diaries religiously, in part because we made it easier for them to keep their diaries, because we told them how many calories were in the foods we gave them. We found that this giving them the foods that they were to eat led to greater reductions in dietary fat. So they ate what we were giving them, and what we were giving them was healthier. And it also produced greater knowledge of calories. By giving them the food, showing them about portions, they learned more information about calories and actually did better on knowledge tests about calories. So we think for all these reasons that the food provision was working to produce better weight losses, and we feel strongly that this type of more intensive, more direct behavioral approach is going to be an important way of producing better weight losses in our patients. Now in moving to the 90s, one of the other things that we have been doing is looking at the combination of behavior modification and very low calorie diets. And we've been comparing those results to programs that are behavior modification alone. Now, by very low calorie diets, what I mean are diets usually of about 400 calories a day that are either taken as liquid formulas or as lean meat, fish, and fowl. These are diets similar to what you've heard about commercially in programs such as OptiFast. In our study with these very low calorie diets, what we did was we recruited obese type 2 diabetic patients and randomly assigned them to one of two groups. One group got a standard behavioral treatment program with a balanced 1,200 to 1,500 calorie a day diet throughout the 20 weeks and all during maintenance. This group was given behavior modification and a very low calorie diet. They ate 1,200 to 1,500 calories initially, and then for eight weeks, they used a very low calorie diet, eight out of the 20 weeks. Then we gradually increased their food back to 1,200 to calories, and then during maintenance, they had the same diet. So the only difference between these two groups was in this eight-week period of very low calorie diet. Now, you would expect that this group would have a better weight loss initially because they've eaten less. If you look at from here to here, they've had a period where they only ate 400 calories, whereas this group was eating 1,200 to 1,500 throughout. So that's almost expected, that initially this group would do better. The important question to us is, what happens out here? Does getting better initial weight losses help out here or not? And that's really the question we were trying to ask. Now, Dr. Tom Wadden asked that question with a group of non-diabetic obese individuals. He had three groups in his study. He had one group that got a very low calorie diet without the behavior modification at all. Those patients lost weight and rapidly regained it. Okay? Con consequently, I think that approach, using a very low calorie diet without any behavior modification, is not one that has been, remained popular at all. It is not one that we even chose to study, and I think most people are not using that approach. 
In fact, almost all the commercial programs that use very low calorie diets use it in combination with behavior modification. When you look at the other two groups of Wadden studies, this is the group that was get, getting the behavior modification only, and this is the group getting behavior modification and a very low calorie diet. And as you can see, initially, the very low calorie diet group lost more weight, as I said you would expect. And out here, they lost somewhat more weight, too. But this was actually not a statistically significant difference between those two groups. So you would conclude, looking at this data, that at one year follow-up, they really didn't differ in long-term weight loss. Now, how did my type 2 diabetics, that really were done exactly the same as this, how did my type 2 diabetics look? Well, here's their weight losses. And again, very much the same pattern. Initially, being treated with the behavior, behavior modification and VLCD. Now, I should point out, mine is behavior modification and VLCD versus behavior modification or behavior therapy alone. Okay? When you use the combination, I got much better initial weight losses, but these patients regained the weight, and at one year follow-up, there was absolutely no significant difference between the two. So I think from these data, you would have to conclude that in terms of weight loss, the use of the very low calorie diet is not warranted. Why make patients do this if it doesn't produce long-term weight loss? However, when we looked at our type 2 diabetics blood sugar control, the story was very different. Here we found both initial and particularly long-term improvements in blood sugar control for those individuals who've been treated with the very low calorie diet. Something about that period of strict dieting, of almost fasting, seemed to produce a long-term impact on their blood sugar control. Now, in moving to the 90s, we began to ask about using very low calorie diets in the context of long-term treatment programs. And we developed a new study design where we would use a, a very low calorie diet initially. You can't keep someone on a very low calorie diet on 400 calories for the rest of their lives or for the whole year of treatment. So if we want to go to a chronic disease model with very low calorie diets, how could you use them? We thought maybe one way to use them would be to use them intermittently. Put people on it for a while, take them off it for a while, put them back on it for a while in hopes of getting a new burst of weight loss and perhaps a new improvement in blood sugar, and then take them off it for a while. So on, off, on, off was our thinking. And we compared that to a chronic disease behavioral treatment model where people came in every single week for a full 48 weeks, for a full year of treatment. So both groups come weekly. This group stays on this diet throughout. This group has two periods of very low calorie diet. Again, we wanted to know what would happen for weight loss and blood sugar control. This slide shows the weight losses. By the way, I'm showing these weight losses now in kilograms. It's a little confusing, I know, in my slides. Some of them are pounds, some are kilograms. The best way to think about that is to think of kilograms that you multiply 2.2 to get back to pounds, OK? But what you can see here, just looking at the pattern, is that the group given the very low calorie diet, which is shown here in the filled in circles, had significantly better weight losses during the first bout of the very low calorie diet. They then maintained their weight losses. Now, this is the second bout of the very low calorie diet. You can see they lost almost no weight the second time. We've analyzed that very carefully, and we can show that that failure to lose weight the second time results completely from poor adherence to the diet the second time. Patients went on it the first time. They loved it the first time. They came off of it. All during this time, they cried to go back on. They were so eager to go back on. When they got back on, they found it very hard to adhere the second time, and it produced very little weight loss. And then this is the, the last three months of the program where you can see some regain. Now, this is the standard behavioral program that came in weekly and was on 1,000 to 1,500 throughout. They lost weight initially, and they maintained their weight losses fairly well over the, year, the remainder of the year. However, in this study, there is a significant difference in long-term weight loss. The behavioral group lost about 10 kilograms at the end of the year study, or about 20 pounds, whereas the um, very low-calorie diet lost about 14, 14 and a half kilograms, closer to 30 pounds. And that was a statistically significant difference. So in this particular study, there was some evidence that the use of the two very low calorie diets did improve weight loss, but not tremendously so. And most of that improvement was due to this first VLCD with very little effect of the second. 
Now, what about the blood sugar results? Well, again, I'm showing you hemoglobin A1, this measure of long-term blood sugar control. And again, you can see that this fasting, the very low-calorie diet shown here with the dark, the filled-in circles, produced dramatic improvements in their blood sugar control, far greater than the improvements initially in the behavioral program. But then over time, the behavioral program kind of catches up so that over those latter months of the program, the two groups are having actually comparable changes in their blood sugar. What's striking here is that both groups have very nice changes in their hemoglobin A1, and they're really at the end is no difference between the two groups, although the mean blood sugar of the very low calorie diet group throughout the year of treatment does turn out to be statistically different from the mean blood sugar of the, of the BT group. So again, some slight evidence that the very low calorie diet group may improve blood sugar, not as dramatic as I saw in my first study, and again, most of this impact seems to be from that first very low calorie diet. Now at this point, having done these two studies, I think my conclusion would really be that very low calorie diets do show some promise in the treatment of type 2 diabetic patients. We need to study how better to use them. I'm not sure that this intermittent format was the best way to go. And I think we need to study other approaches to using very low calorie diets, either intermittently or in relationship to different, different periods, like when a person starts to regain their weight, might be a good time to put them on a very low calorie diet. I think we need to be creative about how to use very low calorie diets. At the moment, my data would suggest that it's mostly the first bout of VLCD that may be helping people. And as I say, I think it really, we need to figure out how to use these very low calorie diets as part of a long-term treatment program. Now we also have begun to ask about the combination of very low calorie, excuse me, about the combination of low fat diets in combination with calorie restriction. Most of the studies I've shown you thus far, we just told people to cut down their calories, eat 1,000 to 1,500 calories a day, and we didn't focus very much on how much fat individuals were eating. Well, clearly, I'm sure you're all aware of the recent literature that's arguing that cutting back on fat may also be an important part of helping individuals lose weight that fat may be fattening in and of itself, and that it may be important for individuals not just to cut back their calories, but to actually decrease the percentage of the calories that's coming from fat. Plus, fat would have the, cutting down fat would have the added benefit of helping to protect against coronary heart disease. So we asked another question from our type 2 diabetics, which was, does use of a low-fat diet, less than 20% of calories from fat, improve outcome compared to a calorie restriction alone? We randomly assigned our type 2 diabetics to one of two groups. One group worked just on cutting back their calories. They were instructed to eat 1,000 to 1,500 calories a day with less than 30% of their calories from fat. But we didn't put a lot of emphasis on the fat. We had them self-monitor only their calories. So they would write down what foods they'd eaten and figure out how many calories were in that food, but not how much fat. And that takes the emphasis off of the fat. We compared that to a group that was doing calorie restriction plus fat restriction. Same number of calories, but this group was asked to come down to 20% of their calories from fat, and they were actually asked to focus on the amount of fat they were eating by writing down not, not only the calories in every food, but also the number of grams of fat in every food that they ate. And they had a goal, not only for calories, but also for how much fat they should eat each day. Now, these are our weight losses at the end of the 16-week program. And you can see that the group that was doing fat and calorie restriction had significantly better weight losses, about 9-kilogram weight loss, compared to about a 5-kilogram weight loss in the group that's doing calorie restriction only. The group, both groups had significant improvements in their hemoglobin A1, but there were no differences between the two groups. This is the calorie restriction group at beginning. And after 16 weeks, this is the fat and calorie at beginning and after 16 weeks. Both groups come down, but they both come down the same amount. We also showed the comparable types of things at one year follow-up. Again, the group that was given the fat and calorie restriction maintained their weight losses better at the end of the one year treatment program. So we feel that there is some benefit to combining fat and calorie restriction. 
One of the reasons we were very interested in doing this study with type 2 diabetics is that there's been some recent studies arguing against low-fat diets in the treatment of type 2 diabetics. Because when you put individuals on low fat, it means you're putting them on a high carbohydrate diet. And some of these studies have argued that a high carbohydrate diet for type 2 diabetics can result in worsening in their lipids and their glycemic control. However, these previous studies have all used weight maintaining regimens. They've tried to keep individuals at constant weight and look to see the effect. We felt that the question should be addressed within a calorie restriction model, within a weight loss model. And we find with using weight loss, calorie restriction, that adding the fat restriction helps with weight loss, as I've shown, and has no negative effects on lipids or on glycemic control in the type 2 diabetics. So we feel that there, we should continue to look at the use of low-fat diets in combination with calorie restriction in the, in the treatment of type 2 diabetics. Now, I think another change of the 90s has been an increased recognition of the importance of exercise in combination with diet in the treatment of obesity. The importance of exercise comes out in numerous different studies and in all kinds of studies. This is one study, which was a retrospective study by a woman named Susan Kamen. What Susan did, what Dr. Kamen did, was to study three groups of individuals. One group of individuals were controls. Who had ne they were normal weight controls who had never been overweight. Another group were a group of people who had successfully lost weight and maintained their weight loss. And the third group was a group of overweight people who lost weight but then relapsed. And she looked at what distinguished these three groups. One of the best variables to distinguish them was in terms of how much exercise they did. Individuals who were normal weight and individuals who maintained their weight loss successfully, both reported, about almost 100% of those individuals, both reported doing regular exercise, that is exercising at least three times a week, 30 minutes each time. Whereas the relapsers, only about 40% of them reported doing that much exercise. Now there have been many other studies that have argued, shown much the same thing, that one of the best predictors of who is going to relapse is those individuals who stop exercising or never start exercising seem to be most vulnerable to regain their weight, whereas those individuals who keep exercising seem to be the ones who keep off their weight. Now, this has also been shown in experimental studies where you randomly assign people to diet or exercise groups. Now, this is a very busy slide. You're probably looking at all these horrible lines and wondering what's going on. Let me make it simple for you. There are four different diets used here. And the four diets are used with exercise and without exercise. These four up here are the four diets used without exercise. And these four down here are the four diets used with exercise. And what you can see very dramatically is it didn't matter what the diet was. All the groups that didn't get exercise regained their weight. And all the groups that got exercise kept it off much better. Suggesting that whether or not someone is given exercise as part of the program may be much more important than anything we do in the diet. Now, we've done the similar kinds of studies with our type 2 diabetic patients. And again, we show importance of exercise. In our study, we randomly assigned some patients to work on diet only and some to work on diet plus exercise. And as you can see here, the group working on diet plus exercise had significantly better weight losses at 10 weeks, 20 weeks, and at one year follow-up. This is one of the old studies where we saw people weekly here and then stopped seeing them. And you can see there's a lot of regain, although this group did do better. We are now studying what happens if you keep people coming in and exercising with you all through here. Can we keep this line down? Those are some of the new, you know, kinds of new directions in, involving this chronic disease model with the realization that exercise is important. Now, if you look at a study like this, and you look at the one before, and you say diet plus exercise works better than diet only, the question becomes why? Why is this combination of diet plus exercise effective for long-term weight loss? There are several possible explanations. One is that diet and exercise work additively. That by diet, you get some caloric restriction, some change in calorie balance. And through exercise, you get an increase in caloric expenditure. So you get greater change in greater caloric deficit overall. You add the two together. Another possibility is it's not just 
additive, it's synergistic. Maybe there's something about putting people on a diet, getting them to lose weight quickly, that helps them stick to an exercise program. And maybe there's something about exercise that helps people stick to a diet. Now, we've been looking at those kinds of questions, and we've been look at, looking at them within the context of a new study that we're doing. This is a study with individuals who are overweight and also have a family history of diabetes. These are adults, but, and they all have a parent, one or two parents, with diabetes. The individuals I'm studying, as I say, are adults, but they don't yet have diabetes. But they're overweight. They have a parent with diabetes, so they would be at high risk of later developing diabetes. And we're trying to see if we can intervene to help reduce their risk of diabetes. And we're intervening with four different approaches. One is not to give them any treatment. Another is to use a diet. Another is to use exercise. And another is to look at diet plus exercise. We've only started this study, so I don't have results to tell you yet. But there has been some interesting data that suggests maybe why diet plus exercise works better than diet or exercise alone. And that comes from the finding that something about the combination of diet plus exercise seems to make people much more adherent to the treatment that we're trying to get them to do. Now, in this case, I have people in an exercise program who are being asked to come and exercise with me at least twice a week. I have three exercise sessions for them to choose from, but they're to come two out of three times. The diet plus exercise group is likewise told to come and exercise with me two times out of three sessions a week. So they have the exact same requests for how much exercise they should do. This group also is told to diet. Now, if you think about a behavioral approach, you might think that asking someone to work on diet plus exercise would be a lot. Might be a lot of changes, and they might do less well at either change. But actually, our data suggests just the opposite. We find that the people who are asked to do diet and exercise actually are more adherent to the exercise program. They come to more of these prescribed exercise sessions. That group attended about 85% of the prescribed exercise sessions, compared to only about 60% in the patients who were just told to work on their exercise. So we think one of the reasons that diet plus exercise may be particularly useful for patients is it may get them involved in the whole program, maybe what they like best, and may create more of an involvement, and they may do both parts of the program more enthusiastically. Now, this shows the same data in another way. This just looks at the weekly attendance at each of these exercise sessions per week. And shown here are the diet plus exercise groups, and shown here are the exercise only groups. And you can see that attendance goes up and down. In part, that's due to things such as the weather. But you can see that throughout, the exercise only group has lower rates of attendance. This is the percent of the patients who are attending. Throughout, the exercise only group does poorer. Now, this week, we said to the people, instead of just walking with us, let's go and join a big event that they're having downtown in Pittsburgh. And what they were doing was inviting the Steelers to come and walk. So that week, you had a chance of going and walking with the Steelers. And look what happens. Everybody comes. <laughs> the diet and exercise and the exercise only group has very good attendance, but it quickly falls off when they realize the Steelers aren't around anymore. And you can see by the even this week 11 of the program, attendance clearly in the exercise group is worse than in the diet plus exercise. But you can see that even here, our attendance is only 55% of the patients are attending both of the exercise sessions. So clearly, as you develop long-term exercise programs, even though exercise is very important for weight loss, you can see what one of the major problems is, which is getting people to adhere to the exercise long-term. We feel that one of the things that we need to be doing as behaviorists is studying new approaches to increase exercise adherence, since exercise seems to be an important part of the weight loss package. So in conclusion, I think we've made progress in the behavioral treatment of obesity and the application of these principles to the treatment of the obese type 2 diabetic patients. I show you some of my own data to illustrate some of the progress that's been made in the last 10 years. This is the progress I made over the 10-year period in the treatment of type 2 diabetics from my first study to my eighth study. I doubled my weight loss during my initial treatment, and I caused it almost a 
quadrupling of my effect at the one year follow up. Now, a lot of that difference relates to the treatments, the, the things I'm telling you about today, the use of longer term chronic disease approaches, the emphasis on diet plus exercise. In this case, we didn't use low fat diets, but I think if you added low fat diets and perhaps very low calorie diets to the treatment package, you might even do better. So I think there is progress. Clearly, the results are still modest. But I think, I hope you've seen that even modest weight losses of this type may be very important for the type 2 diabetic patients. And I think there are some things for us to be considering as we move into the 90s and do a tr long, new treatment approaches. One is that I really think we need to be treating obesity as a chronic disease and developing long-term interventions. Now, the questions that's going to hit us as researchers and as therapists is how do you get patients to stay in these programs long-term? We know that they need to stay there to help them, but it's very difficult to get patients to agree to come weekly for two years, three years, four years, but I think that's what they're going to need. We also need to know how do you, what do you do in these treatment groups? If you're seeing patients weekly for four years, what do you do? There's not that much you can tell them every single week. What should you be doing with them at each of these meetings? And how can you prevent them? How can you see if they're about to relapse, and how can you prevent that relapse? I also think we're going to be needing to use stronger behavioral manipulations, as I've been showing you here, such as providing food to patients, using intermittent, very low calorie diets, using structured exercise programs, using low fat diets. And I think if we can combine these more intense approaches with a chronic disease model, maybe we'll be able to improve our results still further in the rest of this decade. Thank you. be happy to answer questions. Yeah. I don't know if you paid him enough. He said $25 a week. Maybe well, if it was $2,500 a week, I would have lost money. Where does it stop? Uh, well, it, it's actually interesting. We, de we debated a long time about the magnitude of the money, OK? Um, it is possible that $25 wasn't enough and that you know one, one approach to a research project would be to see. I mean, I believe there is an amount of money that you should be able to pay people and control that behavior, OK? I think there's another problem, though, with, with the way we had to set up that study and the way we did set it up, which is that we were paying people for weight loss or weight maintenance. Okay? Really, these are behavioral programs, and our focus really should be on behavior. What we really want to be paying people for is changing their behavior. The problem is that we can't get good measures of people's behavior. I can't go and find out how much you ate or how much exercise you did. Um, so one, one need we have in this field is to get some good measures of intake and exercise. Then $25, if used appropriately, may be enough. We're actually finding that even smaller amounts of money, actually a lottery system, may be very useful in manipulating exercise behavior. And that may be because what we're actually doing is, is rewarding patients for attending exercise sessions. There, we're looking at a behavior, attending. And I know whether the people attend or not because I'm right there to check them. So there I'm using my reinforcement more related to the behavior. That may be the problem. I mean, one possibility is that the magnitude of the money wasn't enough. Another problem, potential problem, is that what I was giving the money for was the wrong thing. Okay. Yes? Um, well, it's changed. Let me, let me see if I can point out the changes. First of all, in all my current programs, we now have not only calorie monitoring, but fat monitoring. That's number one. Um, the exercise prescription is probably quite similar. The, probably the biggest change in mine and other people's behavioral treatment program is the emphasis on relapse prevention techniques, Marlatt and Gordon type of approaches. We spend a lot of time with individuals explaining to them that relapse is something that's inevitable, that lapses are inevitable, that we need to use these lapses as learning experiences and help them identify when lapses are occurring and what they can do to treat those lapses. So I think that's probably the biggest addition. My definition of a binge. Um, the definition I use of a binge really comes from the DSM-3 criteria for, for bulimia nervosa, which is 
Um, I'm, not, I'm going to block on the exact wording of it, but it's, it's a large amount of food. And the large amount of food has to be um, large not only by the patient's standards, but by an experimenter's standards. And with that large amount of food, the ingestion of a large amount of food, there's a frequency quite criteria. So that has to occur at least two times a week, every week or ex over the past three months. Okay? And uh, the other thing is that it has to be associated with a feeling of loss of control. So it's all those criteria. But basically, what we are doing when we work with binge eating in the obese individuals is we are using the definition of a binge that has been used to date in the bulimia nervosa literature and will be recommended now in the DSM-4 criteria for binge eating disorder. Yes? I actually, in all of my studies, have not gone beyond the 12 to 18 months. Uh, oh, actually, that's, that's, that's a lie, and I didn't mean to lie. I'll tell you about one in a second. <laughs> um, in fact, I'll tell you about it right now. In this trim study I showed you, where um, the trim is when we provided the food, I only showed you that through 18 months. There is a 30-month follow-up. What we did after 18 months was we stopped everything. We stopped giving them the food. We stopped giving them the treatment. We stopped giving them the money. Stopped everything. What do you guess happened to the weights? Went back up. And that's exactly what happened. Okay? Now, my question is, it was going back up. You could see it was still even going back up with the giving of the food and the treatment. I don't know if I had kept that going for 30 months, if it would have helped to mitigate that. Okay? Um, we just didn't do that. But one thing I do know is if you stop it, it doesn't work. Okay? Yes? Right, right. Um, I did not talk about combination therapies of combining behavioral treatments and pharmacotherapy, and I did not talk about pharmacotherapy se separately, just in the interest of time. But let, let me address the question. The, the question really was about the Weintraub study. The Weintraub study used a combination of drugs, it used fentermine, fentermine and fenfluramine in combination in the treatment of obese patients. Plus, all the patients on the drug were also given behavior modification. And what he found was that the combination of behavior modification and the two drugs together produced very nice maintenance of the weight losses. The weight losses were not tremendous. They were relatively modest, but they were well maintained over time. The group that was given behavior modification and the placebo did not lose as much weight at all and did not maintain their weight as well. He, he, I, I don't have the numbers directly in front of me, but he, did, he kept them on this as a double blind study initially, then after a while took them off the double blind, single blinded it, and changed some of the treatments. You know. So that it's hard, really, I think, to look at his four year data. Right? But the initial phase of the program looks very successful. It clearly needs a long term trial. But I, and I think that that trial really should be a trial of the combination of combination drugs plus behavior modification. Now, we've also been doing some work with behavior modification in combination with Prozac, Lovan, um, which is the, the Lilly drug that's used for depression but has also been shown to produce weight loss. And I have had some positive results of the combination of behavior modification and Prozac in the treatment of obese patients. I, was, I have significant effects with that drug. It worked quite well for me with behavior modification. However, I was part of a large study, and across all the centers in the study, it did not work well. Um, I was the only one, though, really doing behavior modification with the drug. So I think, again, that's another drug that might deserve more study with behavior modification, without behavior modification, as different treatment approaches. So I, I very much think that the area of anorectic drugs is, is a very interesting one to study, A, as a treatment alone, but B, in combination with diet and exercise interventions. I think we're going to have to go with combination approaches. Yes? Um, I noticed on the first two graphs that you showed over a long period of time, I think it was a 12 or 18 months, that no matter what the, the variable was, at six months, the weight started going back up again. You're right. And I was just wondering if this is a failure of the main possible explanation. For yeah. 
good observation, okay? And it's actually fascinating. If you take 200 people and you lay out individual plots, what you see is that almost everyone starts going up around six months, six months, seven months, eight months. And it's very interesting because they all start going up at six months, seven months, eight months, almost regardless of how much weight they've lost. Which to me, I mean, I think many people would say, oh, you hit your set point and your biological set point makes you start going back up. I have more problem with that explanation because it seems to be more related to length of time in the program than it does to actual weight loss. It doesn't seem to be how far down do you get the person. You know? It seems to be something about six months. And, and I'm actually quite interested in that. I mean, I think it's, you know, I, th I think people may sustain their activities for about six months, 20 weeks. And in fact, I've been sort of interested in looking at things like chess clubs you know, and finding out how long do people stay in chess clubs and do they have trouble at around 20 weeks. You know, is there something about how long we will adhere to a new behavior? And, and is that about how long that these groups are sort of interesting and after that they get boring? I, so I really, so the answer is I don't know. You are correct in your perception whether that is a behavioral type of problem sort of due to boredom, whether it is a physiological thing that they've lost enough weight that they're, you know, having trouble maintaining it. I really don't know. Yes, up the top. Well, well let, me, let me answer you in two ways, okay? First of all, let me answer you a little bit about individualization. Our program is actually fairly individualized in the sense that we, um, we set individual calorie goals, so that I, that's why I always gave you a range. The calorie goals might be between 1,000 and 1,500, but that is individualized depending on the individual patient, depending on their weight and other things about them, how, how much weight they're losing, et cetera. The selection of foods by the patient is totally individualized so that we give them a calorie goal, but we teach them to use that calorie goal as, as they would like and to eat the foods that they would like. So some patients eat very small breakfasts and big lunches and no dinners, and others eat you know, much smaller lunches and you know, big dinners. They eat different types of foods. The guy I showed you was eating a lot of shrimp and pasta. Other patients might eat something totally different. The exercise, too, is totally individualized. We work on a calorie-based exercise program so we tell people how many calories you should get in exercise, but you can, we show them how you can get that same expenditure by skiing or by walking or by biking or et cetera. Mm -hmm. So there is a fair amount of individualization in the program. Now the second aspect of your question had to do with intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. And we actually are moving more and more to the feeling that you may need more extrinsic motivation for a longer period of time that the intrinsic motivation may come over time, but it may not come from many, many individuals. And that the best way to produce long-term weight loss in a large group of people may be to keep the external motivation there. Yes? Very good question. Not at all my assumption, OK? Um, and we, tr we try to deal with that in several ways. And again, I don't think we've been as good about that as we should. Okay? Let me tell you how we try to do it. When we're looking at self-monitoring records and we're working with an individual on their diet, what we're very interested in having them do, when I talk about antecedents, controlling the eating, one of the things we want to know is what are the antecedents, let, let's say this woman mentioned a binge, okay? What are the antecedents related to a binge? Is it fights with your husband? Is it um, positive social situations? What are the things going on in your life that are directly related to your eating, okay? We approach other things in the person's life in the context of looking at those things as cues for eating. Okay? Now, I think one of the things that behavioral approaches have not done, and again, I would think may be part of the wave of the future, just as I'm talking about combining behavioral approaches with drug approaches, I think there may be some combinations of behavior modifications with other psychotherapeutic approaches. Um, for example, interpersonal therapy is being talked about. Interpersonal therapy has been shown to be quite useful in the treatment of normal weight bulimia nervosa. And I know some people who are starting to apply it to the treatment of the obese binge eater. Interpersonal therapy totally um, does not talk about food at all. It deals with other interpersonal 
um, aspects of the person's life. And perhaps, again, it shouldn't be interpersonal versus behavior therapy. Maybe it should be combinations of the two. So I think we'll be moving more and more into some of those do domains. Well, just let me say one other thing that I think is very interesting in this regard. We know that people lose weight. We know that around six months people have problems. We know that people relapse. One of the things that we can't do is we have a lot of trouble studying the relapse process, finding out what else is going on in their life. Why are they suddenly having trouble? And the reason we can't do those studies, I mean, I keep setting up to do them, et cetera, is patients won't, quote unquote, won't let us do them, okay? What happens is when people start to regain the weight, they get very defensive. They don't want to talk to me. They feel like I'm going to yell at them, even though I'm not going to yell at them. And I just want to help them and have them help me learn about the problem, OK? But they are not, at that point, eager to share information about what is happening. So what happens is at the point where it would be most helpful to learn what is going on, patients withdraw from our programs. They say, it's not working. I don't want to be in your program anymore. We try to see them individually, and often they will not come. So that's been a, that's been a problem in, in this field. I was looking to you for the answer for that. <laughs> um, I think it's going to be a very, it, it, I don't know. I mean, I don't know the answer, OK? What I hope that researchers will do is, is two things. I guess what I really hope is that people will not go out and do tremendous studies with gigantic sample sizes with no idea what they're doing, OK? This is an area where I would very much like to see some smaller studies, not looking at long-term weight loss, but looking at shorter-term adherence, acceptance type of variables. Um, I, think, I think we don't know what to do. We don't know what is going to be the most effective program. So I think we need to be starting to study that in a small way first. Um, as I look at the data on African-American women, women in particular, what strikes me is the low activity level. So I think clearly one, of, one important aspect of the treatment program for minority women is going to be exercise. And the question is going to be, coming back to individualization, how do you individualize it? What types of activity programs will be most appealing to African American women? Um, I also think the food provision model may be a useful one, because that may provide some education and training to African Americans and other groups of individuals who may not be as familiar with what are good low-fat choices, what are appropriate serving sizes. So I think those may be some models. But I really would argue that we need to try some things in, in relatively small scale and see what works. Yep. Did you ever think about, uh, as box you send home, constantly putting less and less in the box? <laughs> oh, that'd be so mean. I put so little to begin with. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't thought about that, but I have thought about a lot of things with the box, and I am doing a lot of work with it. Um, one of the things we're, we're doing with the box right now is we're using it, we're allowing people to select the times of the week, the year that they want it. Okay? We found that when you gave it to people every single week for 18 months, if you remember what happened, it sort of lost its effectiveness. It worked real well and then sort of lost its effectiveness. One of the questions we have is maybe if you let people use it at the points where they needed it, they could use it very effectively. Okay? That's, that's an approach that's been used in the pain control literature. People are often given access to pain control medications, and they have the freedom to individually control when they want to take those pain medications. They have found in those studies that people often use less pain medication in that setting, and they have less pain. It works, the medication works better, because they can use it when they really want it. Okay? And that's been one of our thoughts with the food box, is I don't know what periods of your, you know, if you're, of your next year, what periods are going to be bad for you. But you know, often period, people will go through periods of their lives get crazy. You know, their mother's in the hospital, or their children are all home, and life gets crazy. And we think that maybe if we can convince them to ask us to bring the box to them at that point in time, that that's when it might be useful. You wouldn't have to think about your food for that next month. It's a busy, crazy month. I'm running to the hospital to see my mother all the time. And when I come home, there's food all there for me, and it's the right food. I wouldn't have to go to the grocery store during those phases. So, so that's one of our thinkings you know, to use with the box. I think it's an interesting approach. We think, we think that it has some potential. Um, and we, we are sort of interested in seeing how it applies to even um, lipid lowering. I mean, other approaches. They're, they're, the original idea for the food box actually came out of the diet heart study, which was a, a large trial to get individuals to eat less dietary fat. And what they found there was if you had a food provision center, sort of a grocery store, 
where there were low-fat meats available, that people did better. And that's the same concept. If you make this very available to people, it seems to do better. And I, I think the question is, you know, how do you use it, and what, what different diet problems might it be helpful for? Yes? I'm sorry. I was, Most of mine are volunteers. Okay. Yes? Well, I'll answer you in both ways. Yes, they answer an ad. I guess you would say they're motivated. However, they also usually come with the message from their, when I, I contact their physician to ask you know, permission, tell them I'm going to treat them. And most physicians write me back letters saying, good luck. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this patient is the most difficult patient in the world. I'm so glad she's coming to you. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's a mixed blessing. <laughs> yes? How do you explain the misperception of the obese person of under-reporting their physical activity and over-reporting uh, their diet? Right, right. It was in New England Journal, yes. Um, the question is, how, you know, how do I explain the under-reporting of um, intake and the over-reporting of exercise. And I think I would answer you in a couple of ways. First of all, I think it's actually extremely difficult to accurately report what you eat. Okay? Um, even if you get trained therapists, people totally committed to doing it, and you really stop them and say, you know, didn't you nibble anything today like when you were cooking a food? Didn't you put anything in your mouth? And I'll say, oh yeah, I did. I tasted that stew I was cooking. Well, it's no place in their diary. Okay? I think it is actually extremely difficult. We eat so many times in the day, so often unconsciously, sort of, you know, not, not really thinking and not sitting down necessarily. So I think it's actually very difficult to accurately record one's intake and exercise. Um, and I think that that problem is probably worse in people who are eating a little more chaotically. That if you sit down and you eat breakfast at breakfast time, lunch at lunch time, it's probably a little easier to do it than if you tend to be a nibbler or tend to, you know, eat more erratically. Now, in that study, that, that was a, a relatively small sample. I don't know if those people were eating more erratically or not, but that, those would be the kinds of things I would expect leading to underreporting. I think some of it is purposeful underreporting. I think some of it is accidental underreporting. I think it comes from all different things. Um, my, my classic example was a woman who came to me, a patient who came in, was self-monitoring, and she came in, she said, Dr. Wing, I had a terrible, terrible week this week. I ate everything. And I said, well, let me look at your book. Let's look through it together. And I looked the first day, and I said, this doesn't look so bad. You had an eclair today. She said, well, I left out one thing. I left out the S, eclairs. And I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, there were six of them, OK? Well, that's a little, little distortion, <laughs> just an S. <laughs> And they still keep, and they start going back up. Right. No, you're right. You're right. So one of the questions that we are asking now is, it seems to do better if you keep them in, but you're right. It doesn't stop it from going up. So just keeping people in there forever doesn't seem enough. One of the questions is, is what we need variety. I mean, do you, and I don't know. I mean, do, do you put people on a diet program for the first six months? Then after six months, you say, okay, keep working on your diet, but we're not going to talk diet here at all. We're just going to do exercise. And you turn this into an exercise group for the next six months. Then from months 12 to 18, do you do something totally different? Now do you put them on a VLCD? Okay? You know, is, is it just sort of a variety type of thing that we have to do to keep people interested? What, what you hear from patients is, in all the years I have worked in obesity, I have never heard a patient say to me that after six months I got too hungry. Okay? That hunger was the cue. That I've never, ever heard. I hear much more things like, it became too much of a pain in the neck, okay? Other things in my life became more important. My, this was happening in my life, that was happening in my life. I couldn't devote the attention to this. And I mean, I don't have an answer to this, I don't have a solution, but it, it, the feeling I have is that we can devote attention to one thing only for so long, okay? And it's like for six months, people can attend and work real, real hard on this diet. But then after six months, 
it loses that excitement, that interest, that um, it's no longer their primary focus. And once you take weight loss off out of the primary focus, it seems like you go back to your old habits. And it becomes, you know, it, it's not ingrained yet. So it goes back to the old habits. I think you have to keep it in primary focus. And I don't know how you do that. Okay? That's my hypothesis. But I don't know quite where, where to head with it. Yes. In, excuse me, in OA or AA? AA? AA, right, OK. And if you're using a uh, long-term illness form, mm -hmm. it seems to me that the primary question is, what are the experiences of patients and others with these people on uh, long-term uh, regimens that are apparently quite beneficial? Uh, is there a time sequence? Or Well, you ask an excellent question. I mean, and, and it's not a simple one for me to answer in a minute, but you know, clearly we know that if you, um, hypertensives are put on treatment regimens for the rest of their lives, and if you look at the adherence among hypertensives, many of them do not adhere very well. They take their medication some of the time, but not all the time. Many of them self-medicate. They take it when they feel like their blood pressure is up, okay? Compliance in general is a, a major problem. Many of these things do show erosions. Actually, many of the addictive disorders show problems around three to six months. So it's in that period where you start getting the relapses, OK? So there does seem to be a general curve. Um, I thought you were actually heading in another direction, too, which was, and maybe you were, which is to say that we also need to be looking at other approaches like AA, OA, other approaches where people stay in them long term. Why do some people stay in certain things a long, long time? Why will they keep attending meetings and then try to, to um, build on that in our treatment programs? And those are exactly the kinds of thinking we're doing at the moment. So, take one last question. Well, I do. I mean, I do. Let, let me answer you in two ways, OK? Every study I do is different. So I have profiles of each, you know, from each study when I'm doing my type 2 diabetics, when I'm doing my obese bingers. I mean, I have many different kinds of studies. And they all have different, slightly different profiles. What you find in general is that the obese patients do have high rates, and particularly the obese diabetics, do have high rates of depression. Um, throughout the literature, there's been evidence of sexual abuse. But it seems to be no higher in obese individuals or in eating disorder individuals than in the rest of the population. Um, the, the important thing, though, is that for the most part, these psychological variables have not been associated with long-term success or, or failure. You know, For the most part, we are unable to tell who is going to do well in our treatment program and who isn't. This is really one of the frustrating areas that we can ask, you know, take a whole group of 100 people, put them in a treatment program. We know some of them are going to do well. Some of them are not going to do well. We can give them all kinds of psychological tests. But we cannot predict, using those psychological tests, so far at least, who is going to end up doing well in our treatment program. We really don't have a good handle on that. And that may be that you know, we're talking about predicting who's going to do well at a year or two years. And it may be that all these things change, that somebody's, you know, at one point they, were very, you know, they weren't depressed or their life was not chaotic. But at a year later, things have changed. And so they're, you know, they're, it may be that what happens out here is not going to predict, but really we have not at the moment identified good predictors. Um, certain sociological variables, I'm not quite sure what things you're thinking of. For example, one of the things that we have found is um, obese individuals who have an overweight spouse. So the spouse they live with is a sociological, you know, I mean, if, if you're thinking of something like that, does seem to be related to poorer long term outcome. Okay? Um, there's been some, some data in the childhood obesity looking at number of children in the family with larger numbers of children in the family being a, a negative predictor. Okay? None of these are very strong predictors, though. Um, in some of the studies, um, ethnicity is a predictor 
that we have been less successful so far in working in most of our studies with African American individuals, and that may be, going back to the question earlier, may be that we haven't developed the correct programs for those individuals. So I mean, we have some variables, but there's nothing real powerful that I can really, I can't look at you know, 10 people coming in and saying, you, you, and you are going to do well. I want to treat you. You, you, and you, are, I know aren't going to succeed in this program, so you shouldn't try. Okay. Keep going. <laughs> you just tell me. I'm happy to keep answering questions. <laughs> Two more, okay. <laughs> I have a question about the whole diet. I used to teach a class in diet where you were teaching them the rationale and the consequences if they don't lose weight. And so I was thinking about Julia's few comments about alcoholics and mm-hmm. alcoholics. Mm-hmm. Maybe in some way the alcoholics would be good, and I don't know that much about mm-hmm. the program, but maybe they have a fear. Right. That mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, let me, let me just tell you how we deal with that. And basically, the literature, sort of the social psychological literature, would argue that what you want for behavior change is kind of a minimal, medium level of fear and a very clear action plan of what to do to prevent something, OK? If you make someone, if they don't have any fear, then maybe they won't change behavior. And if they have too much fear, they're going to be paralyzed and they won't change behavior. And if you give them a little bit of fear, and you don't tell them what to do. You just you know, tell them that heart disease is scary, but you don't tell them how to make changes. That's not going to help them much either. Okay? So I mean, basically, I would say that's our goal, is to instill a, little, a medium amount of fear, but not to panic the people. So clearly, when we work with our type 2 diabetics, one of the things we do is we have lectures and discussions of what is type 2 diabetes, what are the complications. We have physicians come in and present. But it is not done with you know, horror slides and you know. Here, here's the worst that could happen to you. Okay? Um, the, the other thing I just should say to you, and it wasn't directly, you, you just made me think of it as you asked your question. I don't want to give you the idea that we teach these behavioral programs by saying to people, you eat 1,000 to 1,500 calories, and that's the only explanation. We spend a lot of time. These, these are really very, um, I would call them intellectual programs in the sense that we spend a lot of time explaining to them why that calorie goal, why weight loss is only going to be two pounds a week, why you're not going to see bigger weight losses than that, why it's impossible to lose 10 pounds overnight. We spend a lot of time discussing things like there's no magic food, that you know, eating 20 grapefruits a day is not going to work, you know, and, and sort of dispelling all these diet myths that people come in with. Okay? So we actually spend a great deal of time. We actually show them the scientific data. We show them studies and results and things like I showed you today and, and explain to them, well, here's what the science is showing. Here's, you know, here's why a low-fat diet might be helpful to you. So there really is a, an intellectual rationale presented to each part of the program. I just couldn't do it with you today because it would take me 20 weeks like it takes me to do it with them. <laughs> yes? Mm-hmm. Well, let me tell you my biggest problem with overeaters. The question is, what do I think of Overeaters Anonymous? And the biggest problem with Overeaters Anonymous for me is that they do not believe in weighing patients. So they cannot provide me with weight loss data. Okay? Um, nor do they approach it as sort of a, a scientific group. You know, where, I mean, not, not that I think everyone has to be a scientist, but it would be very helpful to the field if they would be willing to weigh their patients and their members and then let me know how they do. Because we need such data, all right? We need to know if this is an effective approach. But to me, an effective approach for obesity should be one that produces weight loss. And so I would like to see what the weight loss results are. Uh, the, the closest to that I know of are some experimenters who are trying to quote, sort of mimic Overeaters Anonymous programs in their offices and do it as a treatment so that then they can study it because we, you know, we can't study it outside, so they're bringing it in. Okay. I'd be happy to st- stand here and answer any other questions, but why don't you just come up individually and ask me them at this point, okay? Okay, thank you, Rena. And again, in the back of the room, there is a sign-up sheet for the dietitians for their CEUs and uh, evaluation form for any physicians that want to get CME credits. The next lecture will be June 16th with a provocative title, 
Living Without Dieting by John Perrette. 